Hoplites are iconically depicted as gleaming armies of bronze. However, the dirty little secret which our visual mediums fail to depict, but which ancient authors are keen to point out, is that such armies reeked of fish and onion. So much so, jokes Aristophanes, that one could distinguish between a nation at peace and one at war by the pungency of its air. Today, we will dig deeper into this topic by examining the ancient Greek diet, the logistics of its armies, and the experience of each soldier's daily meals. This is how to feed a Greek army. The stars on screen hail from our friends over at the Greek Phalanx. They're one of the best groups in North America for Greek reenactment, and I can't thank them enough for working with us. If you'd like to learn more about them or would like to join them, I've included the links to their group in the description below. This video was sponsored by Warpath. It's an RTS game for mobile and PC where you join one of three main factions that turn back the tide of the Raven Army. As a commander, you get to build up your base to deploy troops across the warfront, defeat foes, collect resources, form powerful alliances, and clash in skirmishes or all-out war across a global map. You also get to decide how best to maintain the fighting edge by kitting out your forces with a huge roster of 200 armaments divided into 13 unit types of infantry, tanks, and artillery. Master 3D battlefields with combined armed tactics and sweeping maneuvers from the command room, or sway the tides of war with precision sniper missions that see you ID your target, pull the trigger, and watch the bullet cut through the air in your foe. In these intense sniper missions, you're more than just a sharpshooter. You're a critical element in complex operations. Every shot you take can change the course of battle, offering a unique blend of strategic planning and sniper precision. Right now, the Warpath event website also features a tank tower minigame, which you can play to win valuable in-game resources, as well as physical rewards worth up to $300. So support the channel and try Warpath today by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen and use code SNIPER24 when signing up. Enjoy. An army marches on its stomach, but the particular diet of a force was often a reflection of their civilian culture. To this end, let us begin with a review of the ancient Greek dining habits. Generally speaking, their day could be constructed around three basic meals, Akratisma, Ariston, and Dipnon. Breakfast, or Akratisma, was a relatively basic affair, often consisting of porridge or barley bread dipped in wine. For more well-off households, they might add fruit such as figs and dates, or a side of cheese. Pancakes were also a popular dish. These tiganites consisted of wheat flour, olive oil, honey, and curdled milk, which were easy enough ingredients to procure. Lunch, or ariston, was also relatively light and simple. At home, it often consisted of salted fish, bread, cheese, and olives. Nuts, such as almonds, pistachios, and chestnuts were also common, as was a selection of fruits such as pomegranates, pears, or grapes. As a side note, we should mention that fresh meat was expensive for city dwellers and was typically reserved for special occasions. While folks from the countryside had greater access to domesticated or wild animals, they still tended to eat less meat than we do today. Dinner, or dipnon, was by far the most lavish meal of the day. This is where the Greek symposium would take place, a large party meant to encourage interaction and discussion, to bring people together and to speak of philosophy, politics, and current events. While it was generally served at nightfall, there are some attested cases of these dinners beginning as a late mid-afternoon lunch and culminating with a second course later in the evening. Individual diets might vary depending on a person's wealth and location, but there are some recurring themes across the Greek peninsula. Naturally, given its plentiful coastlines, fish was common and main dishes often revolved around seafood. Aristophanes jokes at just how elaborate such preparations could be, with at least 16 major ingredients being added all on one platter. Another reflection of geography was the prevalence of grapes and olives. 
These might be eaten raw, but were widely processed as olive oil and wine, which would be watered down and honeyed in a mixing jar known as a crater. Such food and drink were staples of daily life for meals, religion, and even bathing. No dinner, rich or poor, was complete without them. While Greek farming was not the most prolific in the Mediterranean, it nonetheless provided many more additions to one's table. This included onions and legumes, such as lentils, chickpeas, and fava beans, or root vegetables such as turnips, carrots, and radishes, as well as leafy greens like cabbage, lettuce, and mustard. Such additions were relatively cheap for most Greeks and greatly helped round off their nutritional needs. As in earlier meals, cheeses made their appearance, usually as soft variants, and fruits such as figs, dates, and pomegranates were extremely popular, though their availability was limited based on the season and natural perishability. As such, they were often held in high regard, featuring prominently in Greek literature and mythology. Fruit could be candied with honey for extended preservation and made a great dessert alongside other small cakes or snacks which may have been prepared. Exactly how much of this three-meal tradition was reflected in a soldier's diet on campaign would have very much depended on the situation. For a greater understanding of this topic, let us now take a look at the process by which a Greek army supplied itself whilst on campaign. Because conflicts of this era tended to be rather short and localized, Greek logistics were comparatively underdeveloped. Most armies had no centralized system of supply or quartermaster. Rather, it was expected that soldiers would bring with them several days' worth of rations and otherwise keep themselves fed whilst on the march. This task would be carried out by each man's attendant, who might be a slave, hired staff, or young family member. Herodotus indicates that one servant per hoplite tended to be the norm, but wealthier soldiers might bring more. Beyond this, the fighting men could also have a wider entourage of friends, family, and acquaintances with them for longer campaigns. Even more non-related individuals flocked to such walking cities in search of profit. Taken together, these non-combatants hugely bloated the size of armies, slowing them down and more than doubling the number of mouths to be fed. To meet this increased demand, additional supplies would be collected from allies, plundered from enemies, or bought from merchants who often trailed these forces. Prudent generals therefore took great care in planning their army's march route to ensure its needs would be met. The following is a relevant passage about such deliberations from Xenophon's Anabasis. Quote, Now, therefore, make up your minds whether you will consider this question here and now, or after you have set forth in quest of provisions. My own opinion is, seeing that here we neither have money with which to buy nor are permitted to take anything without money, that we ought to set forth to the villages from which we are permitted to take, since their inhabitants are weaker than ourselves, and that there, possessed of provisions and hearing what the service is that one wants us for, we should choose whatever course may seem best to us. Baked into these calculations is the rather brutal principle echoed by Thucydides in his writing on the Peloponnesian War that, quote, the strong do what they can, the weak suffer what they must. When an army came through one's lands, there was little the locals could do to resist the bronze-clad horde of locusts. In later years, however, Greek militaries shed some of their marauding ways. More sophisticated means of replenishment by baggage train and ship convoy kept armies topped off, while campaigns were kept relatively lean thanks to limits on the numbers of accompanying non-combatants. With this high-level concept in mind, let us now see what the experience of feeding a Greek army was like for the individual soldier. Generally speaking, we must imagine a more basic military diet, which reflected the origin and root of an army, with a preference for foods that were easy to collect, 
easy to preserve, and easy to consume. To this end, it seems that the foundation of a soldier's diet was grain-based. Both wheat and barley were consumed in great quantities. As with the Romans, the former was held in high regard. However, barley proved easier to grow in the Greek landscape and was therefore the more affordable option. Yet, regardless of the variant, all grains would have to be processed in some way. This would be the responsibility of a soldier's attendant. In the morning, they would mill the day's flour, likely with a mortar and pestle style instrument. For breakfast, coarse flour could be boiled to make porridge, while finer flour could be turned into dough and baked into bread or cake. Supplementing the grains, legumes such as lentils, fava beans and chickpeas were commonly eaten. Like grains, they were readily dried and preserved for transport in large quantities. While not the most appetizing of options, these were filling and nutritious meals that would give the soldier enough energy for the day's march and duties. For a more detailed description of what hoplite food may have tasted like, we'll now pass you off to our friend Max Miller from Tasting History. When going to war, always pack a snack, like Itrion. It's really, really easy to make. The first thing to do is to toast your sesame seeds. And once they're toasted, take them off the heat, but keep them warm because they do still need to be quite warm when we finally add them to the honey. So add the honey to a saucepan over medium heat and let it melt. Then stir in all of the seeds until completely combined and then leave it over a low heat to cook for three to four minutes, stirring while it cooks. Then pour the mixture into a lined baking tin. So once the itrion has completely cooled, remove it from the pan and then you can cut it up however you like and it's ready to eat. And here we are, the sesame and honey itrion of ancient Greece. It smells really, really good. That kind of wonderfully warm, delicious, toasted sesame, sesame smell. I mean, because basically that's what it is. I also just love the top. It's so like smoothly sesame. You kind of have to make it smooth before it hardens to, to get it to do that. Anyway, uh, I'm going to try it. Here we go. Crispy as it's supposed to be. What's not to like? It's super sesame -y at first, but as the honey kind of melts, that's the flavor that takes over. And it's cool because at first it's like really crispy, but then it melts and it becomes soft and almost like marshmallow, but a little, a little grittier. Um, yeah, it definitely gets stuck in your teeth, but, but it's really, really good. And it, I'm sure it just packs a real burst of energy. I'm going to be bouncing off the walls. So just like any good Greek tragedy, this one has a moral. When going to war, always pack a snack, like Itrion. Thanks for that insight, Max. Naturally, however, most hoplites would seek to supplement bland rations with more varied ingredients. Much of this would be obtained at the start of a campaign. Aristophanes, for instance, describes how departing armies would go on mass shopping sprees to hoard such goods. Fish could be found in great abundance, though it would have to be sorted and eaten in the early days of a campaign. For the longer term, goat or sheep's cheese was a popular purchase as it was easy to obtain, kept well and was quite light. Another hoplite favorite was the onion. While certainly useful as a flavorful and nutritious ingredient, it was reportedly eaten raw by the men. One can only imagine the smell of a soldier's travel sack, let alone the breath of such an army which lived on salted fish, cheese and onions. Truly, it must have been enough to break an enemy by itself. Indeed, Aristophanes jokes that a country at war could be distinguished from one at peace, largely by the pungency of its air. Other ingredients were collected opportunistically in the field. This included whatever soldiers could get their hands on, be it fruit harvested from an orchard, berries collected from the forest, or nuts ransacked from a storehouse. Yet such practices were not without risk. Dispersed troops were vulnerable to attack and there was no guarantee that what they collected would actually be safe for consumption, as evidenced by the famous account 
of an army becoming debilitatingly intoxicated from wild honey. Returning to our discussion of each day's meals, we can now move from breakfast to lunch. This was likely to have been a lighter snack, which was consumed over the day's march. Once more, the soldier's servant would have prepared such a meal for their master at the start of the day. Jerky, sausage, or biscuits packed with cheese and olives, all made for convenient grab-and-go options. Finally, at the end of the day came dinner. As in civilian life, this was the most important meal of the day. While we should not expect an elaborate symposium to have been the norm, they are occasionally attested to, especially among the upper ranks of the army. The following is a relevant passage from Xenophon's Anabasis. Quote, When they had come in for the dinner, the noblest of the Thracians who were present, the generals and the captains of the Greeks, and whatever embassy from any state was there, the dinner was served with the guests seated in a circle. Then three-legged tables were brought in for the whole company. These were full of meat, cut up into pieces, and there were great loaves of leavened bread, fastened with skewers to the pieces of meat. Most rank-and-file troops partook in a simpler version of this communal experience. Yet, even still, it was the highlight of a soldier's day. As such, dinners were often enjoyed hot, with the best ingredients being used. It would be here that meat or fish would most likely make their appearance. In most cases, these would be spit and roasted over a fire, though dishes could certainly be boiled or stewed if time and equipment allowed. Another highlight of these dinners was wine. It would be kept in large earthenware jugs and poured out into each warrior's cup with added water and sometimes honey. Such wine was key to army morale and prudent generals did well to ensure its steady supply. However, history is replete with examples of overindulgence. Xenophon recounts one more humorous tale of how Greek soldiers pillaging across an esteemed wine region soon degenerated into a luxurious band of snobs who would no longer accept any but the best of wine stocks. In this way was a Greek army kept fed whilst on campaign. We hope you found this topic both entertaining and enlightening. A big thanks once more to the Greek phalanx for their reenactment and Max Miller for his cooking insights. A special shout out as well to our supporters on Patreon and YouTube for helping to fund this channel. And finally, a thanks to our researchers, writers and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team or this community. If you like this topic, be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.